Okay, everyone, here's a video that was requested uh, to do a video for the dispatch release and the SWAT OFP format in SimBrief. Uh, dispatch release constitutes an authorization to operate a flight. The captain's signature along with the dispatcher's printed name on a dispatch release constitutes a legal release as required by FAR Part 121. So we'll jump into the parts and pieces of the actual dispatch release here. We've got Southwest Airlines IFR dispatch release number two. In this case, we had an amendment, so we have a second release. Flight 4412, jet plan of 6580 on April 2nd of 2023 at 0554 Zulu. The jet plan um, we've got here is it says the Jepson plan number for recall out of archives, what we use it for. We look at that number there and we go into our FMC when we do our PWB for our ACARS takeoff performance data and we use that jet plan number there. That's all we use it for. That's not something that you're ever going to need to worry about or as far as I know uh, you'll ever need to worry about using the game. Departure time of 0624 Zulu departing Phoenix and that's going to be at 2324 local 0124 central time. Arriving San Diego 0736 Zulu. Uh, 0036 local time and 0236 central time. Our uh, select our scheduled uh, departure, uh, our, our scheduled uh, time en route of 54 minutes and our estimated time en route of 52 minutes. So we're looking at doing a two minutes under scheduled time. Taxi out of 10 minutes, taxi in of eight minutes and our proposed departure time of 0624 Zulu remarks, aircraft equipment. You're gonna have different things here depending on what kind of flight or operation you're doing. In this case, we've got aircraft equipment. We have ELTs on board. You might see other things like uh, rafts or HF or SATCOM. Uh, another one you'll often see is this fan CPDLC en route. So you can get your PDCs through your A cars, or you can even get uh, frequency changes and altitude changes en route. GPS receivers SA on, selective availability on, refer to pre-flight prediction check. There is a section down here that you would have um, that you don't actually get in this dispatch release through sim brief um, but there is a section that uh, you would have that prediction check and it would just simply say okay or there might be other some other contingency uh, san diego 5g amoc this refers to the the cellular um, alternate method of compliance is what that means normal operations you often see that there's not much that you have to worry about there uh, other Remarks you might see might be class two navigation, ETOPS operation, um, whether it's a flag operation or whether it's dispatched under dis, um, domestic rules. John is actually with me here today. He's a dispatcher. And so if he's got anything that he'd like to add in any of these parts at any point, certainly feel free. John, do you have anything to add in that part? Uh, yeah, I'd just say this uh, dispatcher didn't do too good of a job because uh, with that, um amended release that release number two you're supposed to have a uh, remark uh, re regarding the reason for the amendment but they didn't add that so but uh, basically any information that uh, the dispatcher would want to convey to the flight crew they'd put in the remarks section uh, if they're going to add fuel for you know a turbulence or plan the altitude a lower altitude you know or uh, reroute for weather or what whatever um and any uh, time that they increase the fuel load above the minimum required amount of fuel for the flight. Um, so if it's above minimum fuel policy for Southwest Airlines, then the dispatcher requires to put a, re a remark on the release of reason for the added fuel um, or the non-required alternate. Okay. So a lot of different things can go in that remarks section. Just pay attention to those. Sim brief itself, I don't think puts really anything in there unless you add them yourself. But for realism, you can have uh, different mark remarks added in there. Uh, so only add one if you're weight restricted. That's pretty much it. Okay. Our next section here, flight identification, ATOG section. So if certainly we have our flight number, our aircraft registration number, the nose number, which is going to, for the most part, match the aircraft registration number. The aircraft type capacity is aircraft seating capacity uh, and ATOG. This is probably one of the most important things on the entire dispatch release. And we've, this is your allowable takeoff gross weight. And it's going to be limited by either takeoff, en route, or landing, uh, which is going to be essentially a structural limit. Uh, whichever of the three is the most limiting is what you're going to see here in the LM spot. In this case, it's a landing weight limit for ATOG, our allowable takeoff gross weight. And uh, 
rounded to the nearest 100 pounds. Actual departure gross weights may be less than or equal to the ATOG value shown on the release. Uh, SimReef does not show or simulate this, but you could have, if you had ATOG uh, with asterisks next to it, uh, that would be if the dispatch landing weight limit was greater than the anticipated operational landing weight limit. So then this limit code, in this case we have the L for landing weight limited. You could also see a T for takeoff weight limited or E for loss of engine en route. And the reason you might see that is if you're flying over terrain and you took off super heavy and you had lost an engine, you had to do a drift down, you may not be able to maintain an altitude high enough to clear terrain at that weight. So that's why you might see an en route. You see a landing weight limit like this if it's a short flight. Let's say you've got uh, a lot of payload here. You're a heavy aircraft carrying a lot of uh, passengers. A lot of well, you wouldn't have necessarily a lot of fuel, but a lot of passengers and cargo. So to ensure that you have landing weight, by the time you reach destination, you have to take off. You know, no higher than uh, this number here. And you can actually do the math if you look at the ATOG of 134.0. If you were to take 134.0 and subtract 4,800, which is your fuel burn, you'd actually come out to exactly 129,200, which is your max landing weight structural limit of the aircraft. So that's why you're landing weight limited in this situation. John, anything to add there? Uh, no, I think I think you nailed it pretty good. I guess the, the one thing I just mentioned, if you look down at the performance section, you'll see um, three different weights, and basically ATOG is just um, the lowest of those three. Um, and those are your MRTWs, um, max runway takeoff weight. And that was all planned by the dispatcher. Mm -hmm. So the dispatcher is running his numbers, and then that gets put onto the dispatch release, and he runs the max runway takeoff weight for takeoff, landing, and en route. And then whichever's the lowest of those three, that's going to be your ATOG. There you go. Okay. All right. Our departure airport, Phoenix, and our airport elevation of 1,135 feet. Arriving San Diego, 17 feet, distance of 277 nautical miles. We don't have a takeoff alternate. We do have our, we do have one alternate landing alternate of Los Angeles. We don't have a second alternate. John could go into way more detail on takeoff alternates and landing alternates if you want to. Uh, really, the only time that uh, a second alternate is required uh, is if the weather conditions are considered marginal. At Southwest Airlines, uh, weather conditions are considered marginal when the uh, weather at the destination, uh, pretty much the visibility is right at published visibility minimums for the instrument approach procedure that uh, you would be shooting. Um, so really, all we care about is visibility for destination if we're doing a straight in approach, unless we're circling. If we're circling, then we care about ceiling and visibility, but normally you're not circling at Southwest Airlines. Um, for the destination, for it to be considered marginal, the de or sorry, I'm sorry, the destination alternate. So if the, the destination alternate uh, has to take into consideration ceiling and visibility. So it's going to be 400 feet above height above touchdown for your published ceiling on the uh, approach. And it's going to be um, one mile above published visibility on the published uh approach plate for uh, the approach that you would be planning to to execute if you were having to divert or you could do another method but it's a little more confusing so i'm not going to go into it um, but really that's just pretty much all it is just 401 above um, at your alternate so if it's uh, going to be um, right at those minimums for ceiling and visibility at your destination alternate now you also require a second alternate um, so uh, that's pretty much the only time per the regulations that you require a second alternate. There's another reason, uh, time when uh, per, based off of an exemption, but that's a, a little bit too much in detail. We can go over that in a different video. It's called uh, Exemption 3585, uh, but it's it's not worth the time to mention in this video. We're going to try to keep it nice, short, and sweet for this video. Uh, take off alternate pretty much any time that uh, the weather is not going to allow you to return to field if in the in the event that you know you lost an engine on takeoff for instance or you had an emergency you had to return to field um if the weather conditions are going to be below published minimums for the approach at your departure airport that's when you require a takeoff alternate uh takeoff alternate cannot be further than uh one hour uh with one engine and off and normal cruising speed basically um 
So that's going to be uh, at Southwest Airlines. That is going to be a hard set 320 nautical miles. So your takeoff alternate cannot exceed 320 nautical miles from your departure airport. And that's pretty much all I got for the alternate section. Okay, cool. All right, FMS route. Uh, we don't have stored routes in the FMC, so you can basically ignore the FMS route part there. The next part is the actual route. So what you're looking at there is Phoenix. You're going to depart via the Firebird 1 departure, Mohawk transition, more than likely. Jet 2 to Hogs, lucky one arrival into San Diego. So clearly that's just the route that you filed when you filed your flight plan. Phoenix, latitude, longitude of the airport itself. Top of climb, level 320 is what we're planned our top of climb or what our uh, initial altitude is. Wind direction and speed at top of climb. Temperature deviation from ISA at top of climb. Flight level change, so step climb and location if applicable. If there was a step change or a step climb here, you might see a fixed name like Hogs or well or more Mohawk and then another altitude. And that would be the indication that's that's where you're going to do your step climb at that altitude. If no step climb is provided, then the final cruise altitude is repeated or there's just simply nothing there. So there's no step climb in this case. We're just going to cruise at 320. MEL, CDL, no items. And then another huge part of this whole thing here, uh, I wouldn't go into much detail on the MEL, CDLs because it's really going to be what you create in terms of the simulation. Uh, in the real world, we have MELs all the time. Um, CDL would be a configuration deviation list. So if you had some part of the aircraft missing, like a landing gear door, that might give you some sort of performance impact or performance fuel hit. Uh, they'd have that in the CDL, and of course these are all documented in what's allowed to be uh, inoperative or missing from the aircraft, and there is an MEL document on the VA SharePoint that uh, if you wanted to look at that, you could. John, you want anything on that MEL, CDL? I don't think it really applies to us since uh, the, the dispatch release I had sim brief is always going to say no, no items. items, but like you said, I mean, if somebody wants to, you know, have a failure or something um, that it just to uh, basically the way I was taught it is MEL CDL is going to be prior to the flight being uh, airborne. Sure. So if the flight, if the flight is not airborne yet, it's going to be an MEL CDL. Uh, and the, you, you refer to the MEL book. Um, mm -hmm. If the flight has already taken off, you're going to refer, refer to the QRH uh, and it would not be considered an MEL CDL since the flight has already been departed, uh, dispatched and uh, is airborne. These these are non-essential items too. We're talking about lights, or maybe the Wi-Fi system is in op, which you see a lot. But uh, yeah. Anyway, okay. Fuel weight computation section. This is probably the biggest part of the dispatch release here. So we'll just go through these one at a time. In route burn. Actually, we'll go through them fairly quickly. We'll come back maybe and hit a few of these again. In route burn. Computed fuel burn and endurance time from start of takeoff roll at departure to touchdown at destination. And route burn does not include fuel and endurance for taxi to and from the runways. Uh, contingency hold, additional contingency fuel plan for arrival and approach contingencies. Variables considered are specific route and destination airport complexities, airspace constraints, constraints available runways, nav aids, historical delay data, and distance to other airports in the area for diversion. A minimum of 15 minutes contingency hold fuels planned for any airport. We usually go with 20 minutes here, and it says right down here what that uh, time is that they used for the dispatch release here, which you can see also matches the time here. In that case, we've got 1,800 pounds of contingency slash hold fuel. Uh, dispatch add contingency fuel in addition to contingency hold fuel designated by the dispatcher for weather deviations, in route turbulence, ATC reroutes, and any other condition that could delay landing. Calculated based on a long range cruise at top of descent altitude, aircraft weight, and temperature at that altitude. If dispatch fuel is included, the dispatcher also includes an explanation in the remarks section of the dispatch release, as John had said. Alternate. Computed alternate fuel and endurance time distance, the alternate is based on a great circle route plus minimum distance of distance bias of 30 nautical miles. Certain alternate routings include a greater distance bias to account for arrival routing and airspace complexity. Fuel burn based on forecast winds aloft is calculated using aircraft weight at the arrival airport and includes sufficient fuel for climbing the altitude, long range cruise to the alternate, a normal profile descent and landing. 
FAR reserve, computed fuel reserves, and endurance time based off 45 minutes of flying after consumption of any alternate and contingency fuel. Calculation is based off of long range crews at the top of descent altitude, temperature and weight between the top of descent and the previous waypoint on the route of flight. MEL CDL would be any fuel that might, uh, you'd have a fuel burn there, uh, which is essentially account for any performance hits due to MEL or CDLs that you might have on the aircraft. Ballast additional fuel for compliance with the MEL CDL proviso provisos, which require usable fuel, unusable fuel rather. Uh, minimum takeoff they got there represents minimum fuel required by the FARs at the start of takeoff roll. Calculate as in route burn plus contingency hold plus dispatch add plus alternate plus reserves plus MEL CDL plus ballast equals your minimum takeoff fuel. And you can see the dashed line there. All you got to do is just add those up straight down. Add your extra, add your uh, taxi planned out to get to your minimum planned. And then if you were to add tanker, you'd have your maximum plan. So it's uh, just add them down straight down there. Uh, extra, additional fuel for anticipated ground contingencies at the gate prior to pushback or during taxi out. Plan taxi out fuel, which in this case was 10 minutes, minimum of 300 pounds. Minimum planned then is going to be uh, the sum of the minimum takeoff fuel plus extra plus plan taxi out. Tanker represents additional fuel carried for economic or situational reasons. Sometimes you tanker fuel because it's just cheaper um, at uh, where you're departing than where you're going to where you're going to, or maybe they don't have fuel or as uh, as much fuel at um, destination, so you may tanker for different reasons. Uh, minimum planned or maximum planned rather represents total fuel on board, including tanker fuel at time of pushback. Minimum plan plus tanker equals maximum plan. Operations agent notifies dispatcher if the full amount of maximum plan fuel cannot be boarded prior to pushback. That may be because this is all, again, just planned. And you may have um, variances that in payload that might restrict how much fuel that you can take. Planned arrival fuel down here then of 7.9 or 1 hour and 41 minutes. Planned arrival fuel at destination. Uh, the amount of fuel projected to be on the aircraft upon landing, assuming the flight has been operated at the original planned speeds and altitudes, and no contingency fuel has been consumed. Uh, it is the sum of the following. Contingency hold, dispatch add, alternate FAR receive extra and tanker. The extra and tanker represent uh, a respective endurance times are not displayed on the dispatch release. Over on the other side here, we got operational weight and the weights themselves that were planned at here. So our operational weight of 84,495 pounds, payload of 31,000, zero fuel weight, then of 115.6. We add all that up, we get a plus the fuel on board, we end up with a takeoff weight of 128.3. We're gonna burn 4,800 pounds, land at 123,500. And then over here on the right side, we got the structural limits, maximum zero, or minim, uh, yeah, maximum zero fuel weight of 121.7. Uh, max fuel weight, which is actually the capacity of the tanks of the aircraft, 46,100. Structural maximum takeoff weight of 154.5 and our maximum landing structural weight of 129.2. And I'm sure John can tell you a lot more about some of these numbers and how they're calculated than I can. John, you want to add anything to that? Uh, I guess the one thing I'd like to mention, which I think is pretty important for uh, the VA, is when exactly is an alternate required so if uh, you don't mind i'd like to go over that real sure. quick so uh in layman's terms the the regulation literally says that a destination alternate is always required unless an alternate is not actually required so uh to break that down when is a destination alternate not required so simply put the regulation states that no alternate airport is required if for at least one hour before and one hour after the estimated time of arrival at the destination airport, the appropriate weather reports or forecasts or any combination of them indicate, one, the ceiling will be at least 2,000 feet above airport elevation, and two, visibility will be at least three statute miles. So two examples of this, if we have weather at our, uh, you know, within one hour, um, prior to one hour after our ETA in the forecast, for instance, um, we have an example of weather requiring an alternate of ceiling 1,900 broken, since broken is a ceiling and 
feeling it's just the lowest level of overcast or broken or VV. VV is vertical visibility or also known as uh, indefinite uh, visibility or indefinite ceiling. So um, you have ceiling 1,900 broken and two and three quarter statute mile. Guess what? You require an alternate. Uh, ceiling 1,900 overcast and three statue miles, guess what? You require an alternate. Now, here are some examples of weather that does not require an alternate. Ceiling 2,000 overcast and three statue miles. Believe it or not, you do not require an alternate with this weather. Another example of not requiring an alternate, ceiling 2,000 broken and visibility greater than six miles. In this case, you would not require an alternate. Now, it would still be a good idea based off of the trends of what the weather's doing. Is it improving? Is it getting worse? You might want to add an alternate because chances are that uh, forecast might amend and then you might uh, require an alternate. Um, so it's just something to think about. But uh, other than that, I, I really can't say, I know we're just only doing domestic today for this. So um, I really don't think I can add anything. I think you nailed it pretty good there. Okay couple other things uh this max quick turn weight it's uh sim brief only ever shows zeros that's not something you're gonna have to worry too much about but what it says is estimated maximum quick turn weight maximum weight which aircraft can land at the destination without exceeding maximum quick turn weight based on landing parameters in the performance data section uh essentially what that would mean is you have a certain amount of time before you could turn the aircraft around again but that's not something you're gonna have to worry about too much um also, one thing that we talked about prior to starting the video here is what do we do as far as our fuel entries here in the FMC and the jet? So in this case today, we've got alternate 2.8 plus FAR reserves of 3.1. And someone who's good at math could do that quickly and say it's 6,100 pounds of gas. So what are you going to want to do? What do you do with that number? Uh, when you go into your performance pages on the FMC where it's got and your performance init page where it says reserves, that's the number you're going to want to put there today. It's going to be your alternate plus your FAR reserves is going to be what you're going to put in there for for uh, uh, for that number for reserves and the fuel in the FMC. If or you said 5.9, right? 5.9, yes, because I can't add. See, I just said someone who is good at math. I'm not. All right, 5.9. That's what you're going to want to put in there. Thank you. 5.9. No now. Problem. <laughs> what if you did not have an alternate today? We did not have the 2.8 because we did not have an alternate of Los Angeles here. And our FAR reserve simply said 3.1. Policy says 4.4 at a minimum. So in your reserves, in the fuel, in the FMC, in your perfor performance init page, put 4.4. So never less than 4.4. Otherwise, total those two numbers, and that's the number that you're going to put in the FMC. All right, what else we got here? Average winds, M26, minus 26. That basically means our cruise winds, we're going to have an average of net minus 26 on the nose, so our ground speed is going to suffer today. Uh, cost index of 40 in the NG. I think this question has been asked and answered many times. In the NG, we always use 40 for a cost index. Again, in the performance init page, um, in the max, it's 30. And fuel burn adjustment for 1,000 pounds increase in takeoff weight. Essentially, what we're saying is we're planning to take off at 128,300 pounds. If we were to take off at 129,300 pounds, we're going to increase our fuel burn by 22 pounds. So 22 pounds for every 1,000 pounds increase in takeoff weight. Probably not something you need to worry too much about. Next section, performance data section, takeoff, takeoff weight limit, and performance parameters used to compute the dispatch release. And then, of course, the landing. Landing weight limit and performance parameters used to compute the dispatch release. When runway condition is six dry, uh, we're anticipating the runway to be dry when we arrive at destination. There's only going to be one line there. Uh, when runway condition is not six dry, two landing weight limits are displayed. And John, you know a lot more about that section than I do, so I'll let you talk about that. Uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've dispatched, but um, if I remember correctly, basically there's, uh, on the dispatch side of things, we have a requirement of, um, well, we have a dry and a wet requirement. So basically, it's kind of kind of convoluted, but... The FAA wants to make sure that before this flight ever even takes off, that this flight will no like there will be no um, question that this flight will safely be able to land at the destination. Um, so the regulation states basically that uh, we have to land, uh, we have to plan to land within si the uh, 60 percent of the landing distance available on that runway. 
the first 60% of that runway. And uh, so that's, that's going to be your dry dispatch requirement. Um, so we're going to have to make sure that uh, the uh, max landing weight, the max runway landing weight, um, the plane will be able to perform in, in that envelope that uh, it won't be too heavy uh, in case of a go around or in case the runway is too short or whatever. So uh, we're playing this on the dispatch side of things. Uh, luckily, we have a program called Aerodata that does this all for us pretty much. We're just pretty much just clicking a bunch of buttons and then it does it for us. Um, so the dry requirement is uh, laying within the first 60% of the runway. Uh, the wet requirement is basically um, 115% of that dry requirement, if that makes sense. So, so the first one's 60, now you got 115% of that 60%, that's your wet requirement. Um, so basically as a default, we always plan wet um, by default, just uh, on the off chance that the runway becomes wet for whatever reason, we're still in compliance with that regulation. So that's why most of the time you're just gonna see uh, uh, the dispatcher plan wet for um, the landing runway. Um, now, uh, I'm pretty sure that's also at Southwest. I know that's at the airline I dispatch at, but um, that's that's pretty standard for the industry. If it's a shorter runway, the only time you're ever gonna see them really plan dry, most of the time is if it's a shorter runway and uh, wet could possibly cause you to be wet restrict, uh, you know, weight restricted for whatever reason. Um, but normally speaking, you're gonna see uh, wet for the runway condition on the landing runway. Okay, awesome. All right, our next section, en route. So if we had an ATOG that was en route limited, they're going to have one of two different methods here or things that's going to be displayed there in case you had a loss of an engine en route. And so one is either going to be, uh, it says an en route method or a drift down method. So the en route method would indicate associated ATOG values will offer enough performance in the event of an engine failure anywhere from V1 to destination to achieve a positive climb gradient at an altitude of at least 1,000 feet above all terrain and obstructions. Yada yada. So the second drift down indicates associated ATOG values allow for enough performance in the event of an engine failure to continue flight from the cruising altitude to diversion airport where landing can be made, clearing all terrain and obstructions. Yada yada. So I wouldn't worry about this too much. Um, you would only see this filled out if you had an actual in route ATOG listed. Um, you're never going to see this in sim brief, so I don't think we need to talk too much more about that. Then the just, just the different uh, segments of that as to how they calculated the in route method and whether what the terrain was, what the weights were, altitudes, etc. So I don't think we need to worry about that too much. Uh, it says no limiting terrain right there. Uh, dispatcher, captain, FO course the captain would sign these sign the dispatch release the fo would sign the dispatch release for their fitness for duty and then you've got the actual uh flight plan down here end of release and then you go into the actual flight plan itself and um the ofp part of this and you've got different headers here for this section here waypoint in this case would be phoenix latitude longitude if this was a nav aid like a vor you'd have the name of the nav aid underneath it and the frequency or the airway name Indicated airspeed, true airspeed. So in this case, Judith here, we're planning indicated airspeed of 265 knots, a true airspeed of 450, Mach 0.77, ground speed of 412, uh, at 320, temperature negative 49, and then ATP, that's our actual, uh, help me out. I believe actual temperature. Actual temperature. Okay, there you go. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? Winds. Uh, got uh, tropa pause and minimum safe altitude. Minimum safe altitude, thank you. Uh, winds here, two nine planned winds of 291 at 44. Then we can do the actual winds where the dotted uh, lines are there. Magnetic course, true course, magnetic heading. Segment distance, distance to go. Uh, what do we got? Fuel, uh, segment fuel, and then our actual fuel on board. You could write that in. And that's fuel remaining. Fuel remaining here at the top. The top one, yeah. We got time remaining, uh, the segment, uh, let's see, time, help me out. Yeah, first one's uh, total time remaining, and then the next one's total time. Uh, elapsed. Elapsed. There correct, we go, yeah. okay. Estimated time arrival, actual time arrival, and the segment time. Now, all the little dashed spots here, you would actually fill in yourself. Uh, for a domestic operation, something like this, you don't need to do any of this. Don't worry about any of this. This would be for class two navigation, ETOPS, or you know, everything I can come up with or think that you might want to use this for is if you had a suspected fuel leak, 
and then you could calculate all this stuff yourself and you could see you know are you burning what you're supposed to be burning that sort of thing there's not too much um, that you need to use this for now in the past we had the FMC it did not automatically import the cruise winds and now with uh, Navigraph, you can actually have it so that it will import all your cruise winds, and it should be bringing these numbers in here, including your your descent winds. Now, if you have all that exported, so but we used to enter these winds manually, and now you can have it import those automatically. So that's kind of nice. Altitude and route options. So what do you got here? Altitude alternatives to the filed altitude are provided. So it's three different altitudes here. Fuel and route burn for the corresponding altitude option and route time for the corresponding altitude option and then the FMS route number again not, it's not anything to worry about ATC flight plan I wouldn't worry about this too much it's just your IKO flight plan selection and all the different designators for your navigation capability all this different stuff here so nothing to worry about that too much RAIM outage times no RAIM outages um, and what RAIM is, is your receiver autonomous, auto, <laughs> I can't say it, autonomous, I can't even say autonomous. it. Thank you. Integrity monitoring. Good Lord. Uh, and I'm going to bring something else over here too. Usually in the weather packet, what we'll see is our RAF section. And really what this is for is if you're doing an RNAV approach, you may need to be able to do RNAV down to 0 0.3, 0 0.5, or 0 0.1. And in our weather packet, it'll tell you what your RAM or your RAF ability is. So if you're planning on doing an RNAV approach that you would require 0.1 RNP, you can look and see if there's any ex exceptions or restrictions to the RAF. That's all that is. But there's uh, no RAM predicted outages, and I don't think you're going to see any in the sim. That's just that's just way above the level of what the sim is designated to or designed to to simulate. John, you want to add anything to any of that? Uh, I mean, it's this is all like more real world stuff that really doesn't yeah. apply, like you said. So, uh, but all of those, all of those in the ATC flight plan, if you want to look into um, the uh, the FAA's like IKO standardized flight plan, you know, setup, like you, mm -hmm. know, um, you can you can learn more about like what each one of these things mean. But yeah, you know, mm -hmm. for the average simmer, it's not yeah that really matters. Yeah, I will I will say though. Um, for if you like a couple things, I guess so you have the aircraft type, you have the departure, mm -hmm. um, KPHX, you have 064, that's your uh, proposed departure time. So uh, we call it a P time. Uh, you have your true airspeed of 450 knots and then plot of 320 that you cruise out to, and you got your route, and then you have your uh, alternate. So KLAX, we have one alternate, we don't have two alternates. If you see TALT slash and then out uh, airport, that's going to be a takeoff alternate. You have PBN, nav, uh, data, surveillance uh, for ADSB out, your registration number, uh, elapsed time. Uh, sorry, um, uh, help me out with this one. Um, elapsed estimated time or estimated elapsed time, I believe. So that's the time after departure. We'll be entering that um, center's airspace. So 19 minutes after departure, we'll enter uh, ZLA's airspace. Uh, once we're outside of SoCal, uh, or I'm sorry, because uh, we're going Phoenix to San Diego. So. Uh, yeah, so it would be 19 minutes after departure, we should be entering ZLA's airspace based off of our flight plan. That's what SimBrief at least says. I don't know if I buy that, but sure. that's what it says. Yeah. But that's pretty much it. And then you have the ADSB mode S hex code. Um, you know, we're not going to put that in for every, because every single airplane has its own hex code. We just did a, a default one of LoveJet. We thought it was kind of cool to do yeah. that. So that's, that's kind of like what, uh, kind of uh, uniquely identifies a Southwest virtual aircraft on the VATSIM network. If we see LoveJet on your flight plan, we know you're a Southwest virtual mm -hmm. airplane. There you go. Alternate data, pretty self-explanatory or takeoff alternate, uh, destination alternate in this case, LAX, elevation, uh, MSA, minimum safe altitude? Correct, yeah. Minimum okay. Safe altitude. Uh, distance, 125 miles, essentially is what you're looking at from San Diego to LA. Uh, planning at 16,000 feet. Um, minus 21 on the wind correction, so a 21 knot headwind, 34 minutes in route, burning 2,750 pounds. Uh, that's really what I care about is how much fuel do I need to get there. 
in root wind and temperature temperature summary so um we'll just pick a line here off over firebird at level 250 you're looking at winds at 33041 minus 32 and then the second number there is actually the last number there is actually a shear value it says in the book here so the higher the number 06 in this case is the higher the likelihood that it's going to be turbulent or bumpy that's just all you're looking at there Descent winds, uh, again, if you use Navigraph, you can have those imported into your VNAV descent page automatically. Otherwise, these are the numbers that you would want to put in. You could pick three of those and put those in the FMC. And root radio frequencies, so this is your, your company frequencies, your air, air ink in root frequencies. Um, maybe you've heard of San Francisco radio or New York radio in case you needed to contact dispatch through the radio or uh, need to get a hold of like MedLink or something in case you had like a medical emergency in the back of the airplane. Obviously we don't have those here. All right, that's the end of the flight plan. Uh, then you get into the weather packet, which is actually pretty good. Um, of course it shows your weather for destination uh, and departure. Digital ATIS, the TAF, uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail and then just the NOTAMs here for your uh, departure and destination airports. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? John, you have anything else to add? Uh, I guess we could do a little uh, um, kind of scenario here. To If we look at what our ETA is at um, San Diego on this dispatch release, you can see, is this alternate required or not that we um, Put on the release of Los Angeles. Is it? Do we require an alternate? So I can't remember. What do you know? What the ETA was for the flight? Oh, uh, let's see. We are looking at zero seven three six Zulu. Zero seven three six Zulu. All right. So looking at the dispatch uh, remarks, it looks like there's no um, remark regarding a destination alternate. So if I had to guess, it is a required alternate. And if we look, we have a. You said 0736? Yep. So uh, one hour after 0736 would be 0836. So if you see on that 08 line right there, ceiling 1,200 broken. So that alternate of Los Angeles is required. So just the, the dispatcher did a good job. Yep. There you go. Okay. Now, maybe we should go over a little bit about Sim Brief and the new love cars and tell these guys what exactly they can do and how they can actually manipulate their flight plans. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and also, um, I will uh, mention we are going to be adding uh, a Love Cars 5 dispatch release configurations options, uh, basic breakdown, readme kind of thing in the description of the video. So if anybody wants to reference that, they're more than likely, uh, you know, I think you'll be able to get a lot of your uh, questions answered just from reading that alone. But you can always reach out to staff, but it'll have a pretty detailed layout of um, all the different things that you can manipulate with your dispatch release in Love Cars 5. There you go. So most of you are probably pretty familiar with SimBrief at this point. You can click on the little cloud here to see what the weather is. And as John said, you can uh, look to see whether or not you need an alternate. Of course, you can just select your alternate here um, if you've got they, it. They actually uh, increase that. If you click on it, you'll see that uh, you have, you know, METAR, TAF, DATIS, NOTAMS. You got everything now got when you click there. on that cloud. Okay. So with this new version, it's, it's pretty nice. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whether or not you have a specific um, profile for your jet, uh, I default to cost index of 40. That's what we use in the NG and 30 in the max. Uh, you could all you could uh, manipulate your contingency fuel here. I would just recommend leaving that at always at 20 minutes. Uh, taxi out, taxi in. I think it just comes up with a default number, but you can manipulate those. And then extra fuel. If you want to bring in any extra fuel, uh, you can manipulate that number there. Um, if you did want to tank or extra gas for any reason, I'm not sure where else you would put could put it except for maybe just in the extra fuel block. John, do you have any recommendations there? Uh, yeah, that's that's correct. Unfortunately, if we look at the um, thing that we're going to put in the description of the video, it says the extra field is U.S. pound space. The extra field manipulates the extra fuel found on page one of the dispatch release. The minimum value for extra is 200 pounds, and there is no set maximum value. Uh, there's three notes uh, to the extra field. Uh, note one, exercise good judgment when selecting appropriate value for extra fuel based off of, but not limited to, long departure, taxi delays, de-icing operations, possible turbulence en route, possible ATC reroutes. 
uh, tankery. So yeah, so basically things that you might add for dispad, dispad or for tankering. And you already mentioned what tankering is, so I think we, mm -hmm. we got that down pretty good. Note 2, it says uh, there currently is no uh, tankering fuel option in uh, Simbrief. And this is why tankering fuel must be added to the extra field if you want to add tankering. And then the final note, uh, there currently is not this bad fuel option sim brief for this reason. If you wish to add fuel for possible uh, turbulence, ATC vectors off course or possible um, ATC uh, routing around weather, consider adding this type of fuel in the extra field. There you go. Okay. And then finally, we got Love Cars 5, which just came out today. And uh, John, I'm going to let you talk about all that there. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll keep it brief, but um, we, uh, like I said, we're, we're going to put in, in the description of the video this whole breakdown of a, a each thing that you are able to manipulate for the dispatch release um, on the right-hand side over there, dispatch configuration. Um, if you still have any questions, you can always reach out to uh, virtual airline staff, um, specifically uh, any of our real pilots, um, like Joe, for instance, or you can reach out to me, uh, John Manley. I'm, I'm, uh, I used to be the uh, director of NOC dispatch, but unfortunately I had to step down due to uh, real world flight training um, uh, time constraints. So, uh, but I, you know, I was a real world dispatcher for years, so I, I'm very familiar with this type of work. So um, if you ever have any questions, you can always reach out to me. So anyways, uh, VATSIM flight number, uh, this is really uh, only to be changed if there's another flight on the VATSIM network that's already using your flight number because your flight number equals your call sign, your ATC call sign. So if you have to what we call stub amend your, your uh, ATC call sign, uh, that basically just you go into here, you change your um, ATC call sign in there, and then it's going to, when you go to pre-file um, on the VATSIM network, it'll automatically uh, change your call sign to that flight number instead. Um, so that you can still enjoy the Batsum network and not deal, you know, have to worry about, uh, you know, your basically your uh, flight number on the dispatch release and your ATC call sign on Batsum not matching up. Uh, Takeoff alternate, we already mentioned it. Alternate one, alternate two. I think we've hit that pretty good. Um, like I said, we're going to have a lot of uh, good information in the description of this video if you want to look at that. Um, then you have the route, you have cruise altitude, you have a uh, tail number in case, uh, you know, the, 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 initially with Love Cars 5, we were going to have every single tail number in the Southwest fleet uh, based off of the real world flight. Uh, but a lot of people wanted it to just, uh, you know, because they don't have all of those airplanes in their sim. So they wanted to make sure the tail that they were going to be flying for their flight matches up with uh, Love Cars 5, and now it does. It, on your dispatch release, you have the ability, if you don't have, like, you know, you don't want to fly the real world flights, you don't have that tail number, it's all good. You can just put in the tail number you want to fly into the tail number section, and you're good to go. Uh, biggest thing with Love Cars 5, um, just a heads up, make sure that the uh, aircraft you want to fly uh, matches the tail number type of aircraft you want to fly, okay? Because if you're doing, um, you know, a 800 and the tail number's for a 700, well, guess what? Now your fuel is probably not gonna match up too well. Um, so you wanna make sure if you're gonna, you wanna fly an 800 in the sim, you're definitely gonna wanna make sure your tail number is set to an 800 tail number um, in Love Cars 5. Uh, we actually had a real world self pilot that uh, almost take company emergency fuel last night because of this problem and he was trying to figure out like do you have a fuel leak or something no it was because he was flying to 800 and had a 700 dispatch release so just be, be mindful of that um so going to the uh taxi out and all that so taxi out fuel minimum is 10 minutes maximum normally at southwest is 20 minutes um so love course 5 is uh, not going to let you go less than 10 or more than 20 Anything after that, you would put into extra. So if you need any extra fuel on top of your taxi app fuel, you're going to put that in the extra section. Uh, and then can't hold um, Southwest, uh, you know, real world uh, minimum is 15 minutes. But um, we want to make sure that our arrival fuel is more accurate to a real world Southwest arrival fuel. And so the only way we could do that is just to bump up can't hold the minimum for can't hold. So we just did 20 minutes and it, it's pretty good you're about 5,000 pounds arrival fuel which is pretty normal for for southwest 
kind of where you want to be at if you don't have an alternate that is mm -hmm. um, and then you have the remarks section down there so you can just put any remarks um, obviously you're going to be dispatching your own flight so really do remarks really matter at that in that case well if you want to be more realistic you could add them but it's it's all up to you we don't have any actual requirement at the virtual airline to uh, add remarks but if you want to be more realistic you have that uh, ability to do so uh, in the remarks section. But I, I think that uh, sums it up pretty good. Sure. Um, obviously, once you fill up everything in the dispatch configuration, um, then you are going to hit um, request dispatch. That's going to um, more likely uh, either have you sign into this. It's going to open up a browser and have you sign into SimBrief. Um, the other thing, too, is very important. You got to make sure you are logged into Southwest Virtual's website. So you have to be logged into SWAVirtual.com. Otherwise, it's going to say you have unauthorized access. So that's that's another uh, important uh, thing to uh, mention. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, there, I guess there's an ETOPS uh, checkbox there, too. If you're doing any flight um, from the mainland, so the lower 48 to the Hawaiian Islands or the Hawaiian Islands to the lower 48 mainland of the United States, uh, you're going to select that ETOPS uh, checkbox. We're going to have more information regarding that in the uh, video description, uh, so make sure you read up on that. Um, trying to think anything else. I think we mentioned the majority of it. Oh, cotton hold. The maximum you'll ever see for cotton hold is about 60 minutes, about one hour. You don't need ever need to go above one hour. Um, so for that reason, we max it out at 60 minutes. So anything you'd want to add on on top of that, which I can't imagine why you'd want to add anything above 60 minutes of con hold. But mm -hmm. if you did, uh, you could put that in extra fuel since there's no yeah. location for extra fuel. You don't want to so. throw on some extra fuel. If you're doing an event or something, you could end up sitting on the ground for some time or be in a holding pattern. So for sure. plan and accordingly. The last thing about the alternates and the, uh, the takeoff alternates and the alternates up there where they say none, uh, we fixed it where you, it, you don't need to actually type in none for it to not populate an alternate anymore. Um, it's going to do that for you on the back end. So if you just keep it blank, it's not going to uh, calculate an alternate or put an alternate on your dispatch release. Cool. All right. That's all I can think of. You got anything else you want to add that we might have missed or glossed over? Uh, nope. Uh, I think... Uh, Pretty much at that point, that, that sums up the, the Southwest Airlines dispatch release format. Um, there's other cool features in Love Course 5 you guys can play around with, whether you're able to, uh, you know, have your departure and arrival, METAR, TAF, DATIS, if the airport has a DATIS uh, performance. Um, I think we might want to make a new video regarding the TLR, which is takeoff and landing report. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to basically have a list of all your runways, runway lengths, intersection, runway departure lengths, Tora, which is takeoff run available, a bunch of stuff. So, I mean, you guys got to realize Love Cars 5 is by far the most realistic uh, ACARS program ever to be conceived by a virtual airline. Mm -hmm. and th this is this is pretty much real world level stuff we're looking at here for, for free. It's a free uh, product and, and we're happy to, to provide it to you guys. So we hope you guys enjoy it. Um, but if you ever have any issues, bugs, feedback regarding Love Cars 5, please reach out to us and, and let us know. Um, but I think with that, I think we can close the video. All right. Yep. And just real quick, what John's referring to, the TLRs and your performance. So you do your takeoff uh, data. It's going to give you basically what your engine failure procedure is, whether it's strictly runway heading or return after a certain amount of distance. So you can click on performance tab and click on takeoff data, and you'll see that TLR at the bottom. Yeah, I think that about covers it. I appreciate your help. And we'll close it out. Thanks. Uh, hope that helps.